Alrighty guys, welcome back to the shop. Today is April 1st, 2021, and I am super excited to be bringing you all this video today because this is the best knife I ever made, and I am gonna be giving away all my trade secrets in this video, coming up. Like I said in the intro, I think y'all are really gonna enjoy this build today. We're gonna go ahead and get started here with our Super Steel, which is ZR-108-AL-RV80. This stuff is great, I've been using it for years, but I really haven't mentioned it much in the channel, just because it's extremely hard to source, and you can only get it from certain parts of the world. And I figured it wasn't worth most people's time, but if you really wanna make the best knife possible, this is the stuff you need. It's worth noting that this steel is extremely hard to deal with. It chews through bandsaw blades, and it tears up your belts. I actually contacted Norton, who makes these belts, and asked them for a diamond impregnated version of their belt, and they sent them to me. They're about $45 a belt, but they get through this steel with ease. There is a three year wait list to get this steel ordered and shipped to your location. So if you want the contact information for the guy that sells VR-108-AL-RV80, go ahead and shoot me a comment in the comment section below. As you all have seen up to this point, we have the blade drawn out, cut out and ground out. Now this profile is my most aerodynamic profile. I put it in a 3D CAD program that has an air tunnel function and this thing performed the best. So not only will it cut the best, but if you drop it out of an airplane, it will be the most aerodynamic with the least drag. I like putting a hollow in the handle on one side of the knife and we'll get into why I do that later. After we have the hollow in one side and the rest of the blade ground out, we're going to be putting the jimping in the spine. To do this, we're going to use a triangular file and a round file. Now, a lot of people will try to mark out exact distances here. I found it better if you just go with the flow and try to get the most random design possible in the jimping on the spine. This gives you the most gription whenever you are holding the knife. I also found that a square sharpening choil is superior to a round one from a stress standpoint on the blade. All right, so we're getting ready for a heat treat here. We got this knife perfectly ground so that it has one hollow in the handle on one side. That helps with the sliciness of the knife, so we have that done. We also have the jimping on the spine done. No need for that to be symmetrical. It actually works better if it's not symmetrical, so ours is not. And then we're gonna get onto the quench. Now, on the quench, this has been a time-tested procedure that I have used it's taken me years to come up with this solution. So I'm gonna share that with y'all today. And the first thing is, you need a really powerful forge. Your forge needs to be able to get up to well beyond welding temperatures to do an appropriate heat treat of this high-end steel. Now, we're talking about temperatures up to around 1640 Kelvin. Now, for you lay people out there, that's like 2800 Rankin. And it is, it's a pretty seriously high temperature. So that's what we're shooting for today. If you do not hit these temperatures, your blade will be terrible. It just won't work. It, it pretty much won't cut anything. So you need to get this high of a temperature in order to heat treat this steel. It is a necessity. Talking about the quench, we are not gonna be using the amateur quenchants that most people use, like Parks 50 or vegetable oil or anything like that, because that will not work on this super steel. We need to use my proprietary blend of water and canine urine. Now, it can't just be any dog. Your dog needs to have a name that starts with a B, a C, or a T, or a Z, but most people don't name their dogs with a Z, so that one's kind of irrelevant. My dog's name is Toby, so we will be using a T-named canine for the urine. Now, we have to mix that with a water solution, about nine parts water and one part urine. Once you have that perfect ratio of mixture, we can get on to the quench. So we're gonna be doing that next. All great knife makers will tell you that this is the part of the process that gives the knife its soul. Without the heat treat on a knife like this, it will still be a pristine piece of super steel that will cut better than most knives, but it will not be one of the best knives in the world. So to get our knife extremely hard, we will be quenching it at 460 Kelvin into our proprietary quench it, as you just saw me do here. This blade is easily now harder than 99.998% of the other blades on the planet. You can see that I am trying to scratch it here with a piece of NASA grade carbide, and I cannot even scratch the surface of this knife. 
One technique that I use that may be seen as controversial is tempering the blade on the belt grinder. Many knife makers may not like this technique and that is just because they generally do not have the skills to properly temper the blade on the belt grinder by grinding so hot that the blade loses some of the hardness from the heat treat but makes it a tougher knife in general. I have also been experimenting with some alternative grinding techniques while most practitioners will tell you to pinch your elbows at your side and use your body to move your blade instead of your hands. I've been pushing the blade all the way out in front of my body and then also been grinding with one hand. I find that the one hand technique allows me to give a little bit more life into the blade and a little bit more finesse into the bevels that I am grinding. From this point forward, I dub this grinding technique as flow grinding. While it is way harder to learn, I really think it will catch on in the knife making community because like Kyle Royer says, it produces a faster knife that has more swoop and swoosh when used in the real world. Once we finish with our 60 grit diamond impregnated ceramic belt, we will move on to a 220 grit diamond impregnated belt so that we can heat up the blade more efficiently and temper the rest of our edge. With the low grit belts, they don't produce enough heat to properly temper this ZR108ALRV80 Super Steel. After we have achieved a perfect flat grind on the left side of the blade, we will be taking the platen out of the grinder and adding an 8 inch contact wheel to our Northridge grinder so that we can grind a hollow into the right side of the blade. I'll go into some more details later on why I prefer to put a hollow on one side of the blade and a flat grind on the other side of the blade, but just suffice it to say, it increases the performance of the knife. Y'all will be able to witness the performance of this knife later in the video. All right, so let's recap how we got here. So far, we took this super steel and quench it in a proprietary blend of quench media so that the blade is extremely hard. And then we tempered that blade on the belt grinder, which is the best way to temper a blade. If you're using an oven, you're behind the curve. Then we put a hollow grind in one side of the blade and a flat grind in the other side. And what this does is it makes the blade a better thruster in general, and it also makes it a better cutter. So try that out on one of your next knives, and the hollow flat combination, I think is gonna really start catching on in the industry. We also put a hollow on one side of the handle, and what this does is it just allows a little more flick in the wrist when using this knife in general operation. If you're a right-handed person, if you're a left-handed person, you'd have to put the hollow on the other side, but this knife will be going out to a right-handed customer. Before we move on to the handles, the last thing we need to do is put a nice final finish on this blade. A satin finish, while it looks good sometimes, is not nearly as efficient as the finish that we will be putting on this blade, and the finish actually makes the blade a better performer. So that's what we'll be doing next. Yes, y'all did just hear that right. The finish you put on the blade actually makes it perform better or worse compared to the competition. This is a piece of 60 grit sandpaper. Now we have this blade up to a 220 grit finish, belt finish, and that is way too fine of a finish for a good performing blade. I tested 150 blades over a 16 week period and found that the blades that had a circular 60 grit finish perform better than any other finish I tested. Notice that the circular scratches that I am putting into the blade are in the clockwise direction on the left side of the blade and the counterclockwise direction on the right side of the blade. This also counteracts each other and makes it have a more toothy edge. So make sure you're going in opposite directions on each side of the blade. It doesn't matter if it's clockwise on the right or clockwise on the left, just as long as you're going in the opposite direction on the other side of the blade. For the handle scales, we'll be using natural canvas micarta that has little chunks of carbon fiber in it. I found that this stuff is pretty much indestructible and it is impermeable to any type of liquid as well. So if you'll be using this as a skinning knife or whatnot, it is the best option. To drill the holes, drill presses aren't really necessary. I decided to use the cordless drill. And for handle pins, we're going to be using these 316 stainless bolts. The bolts, since they have ridges in them, allow the epoxy somewhere to go and I found that the bolts actually work way better than straight pins and in my testing they work a little bit better than Corby fasteners as well. Before starting your glue up make sure to touch all the pieces with your hands. You want as much grease from your hands on the pieces as possible. This helps with your epoxy bond. We will be making our own epoxy today with super glue and heated up baking grease 
I found that this combination produces a bulletproof epoxy that cures in about 17 minutes. So I mix the two together almost in equal parts and then mix them together for 35 seconds. Within about a minute, it turns white. I don't know why, but it does. And then you can start applying it to your blade. I apply it to all of the pieces of our build and then hammer in our bolts so that they can hold the knife together. I drill the holes that these bolts will be going into about 50 thousandths larger than it had to be. I found that the gap provides the epoxy some space to move around. And I also like the way that the gaps look around the bolts when the knife is finished. One of the major advantages to the super glue bacon epoxy is that it can cure in about 17 minutes opposed to the 24 hour cure times with G-Flex. And from what I've found, it is just as strong as G-Flex is over time. After we get the excess material cut off from our bolt heads, we'll move over to the 2x72 belt grinder with a 60 grit belt to start cleaning up the handles. I like to apply extreme pressure on the sides of the handle so that I can heat up the ends of the bolts. What this does is heats up the epoxy in the center of the blade and actually makes the epoxy bond a little bit stronger. I then like to apply as much pressure as possible to the knife when grinding so that we can burn the micarta. When you burn the micarta, it actually makes the micarta a little bit more dense at that spot and a little bit more resistant to wear in the future. So I try to burn my micarta as much as possible. Once we have the rough shape of the handle finished on the belt grinder, we're going to be finishing it out properly on the hand sanding bench. Just like the blade being a better performer with a 60 grit scratch pattern, we'll be doing the same thing to the handle so that we have a bulletproof handle for years of use with this knife. So we have some 60 grit paper here. We're using a circular scratch pattern on both sides of the knife and also on the top and bottom. Then we'll sharpen the blade up on a fire brick and get on the testing. All right, so we finished the knife up. It looks beautiful and I'm sure it will perform just as well as it looks. We're gonna do two performance tests in order to show you how superior this super steel is against pretty much anything else you've ever seen. The first test will be a plate stab. We will be stabbing this knife through a piece of quarter inch plate. And the second test will be a throwing test where we will be throwing this knife at a two by four. And I'm not really sure what's gonna happen in that test, but we shall find out. After that, I'll give you all some really great pictures of this knife and my verbal recap of the build. got to check this out this is amazing i did not think that we we're going to see these type of results but this is truly phenomenal check this out the knife went all the way through the piece of wood and lodged itself into the fence this is truly phenomenal results i don't know how we can get any better than that that is awesome well guys there you have it that could just be the best knife not only that I have ever made, but the best knife ever made in the custom knife making community. It has the strongest steel. It was made with the best practices. And as you just saw in the performance testing, it's outperformed pretty much anything on the market. So this is hands down the best knife ever made. Now, normally I would say like the video down below and consider subscribing to the channel. But this time around, I don't know if I'm going to be putting out any more videos because this is the best knife ever made and there's no reason for me to continue knife making at this point since I've hit the pinnacle. So until next time, I guess I won't catch y'all on the flip side.